So I want to start this talk. Um, there, there has been a lot of hype about the use of stem cells in, in regenerative medicine. I want to start the talk with telling you a story about a singer, a Hawaiian singer, Don Ho, who's also known as the King of Waikiki, who underwent an experimental procedure in Thailand where his bone marrow was injected directly into his failing heart in the hope of regenerating uh, his, uh, his uh, failing heart. Uh, he was expected to live only for three years uh, on his usual medical regimen. Um, so he booked a what, what was referred to as a stem cell treatment package that included a round trip ticket to Bangkok, a five star hotel and the VIP hospital room. So what happened, he lived in Hawaii. His bone marrow was, uh, um, was taken out and was sent to Israel for processing. He himself flew to Bangkok, Thailand. His bone marrow, after uh, his cardiologist went from Miami to, to Bangkok to meet him, and his bone marrow, and his processed bone marrow was sent from Israel to, uh, to Bangkok for, for the procedure. The bone marrow, the purified bone marrow cells were injected into his heart. The, the total cost was $130,000, and the next day the USA Today headline was Big Stem Cell Success Story. He was interviewed the next day, and he, or days later, and he, 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 he was quoted to, to have said, I have more and more energy. I can feel my heart pumping stronger. I am ready to go another 50 years with my new heart. Unfortunately, he died of heart failure six months later, and the cardiologist who performed the procedure lost his license in 2010 for a procedure for a, um, a procedure of stem cell therapy that, that had no uh, medical proof to be to be beneficial. So medical tourism is has become a, a significant uh, um, uh, part of our economy. It's a sixty billion dollar a year industry in the in USA uh, alone in two thousand and six. Greater than five hundred thousand people traveled abroad for care, uh, and India received over one hundred fifty thousand medical tourists. And if you look at some of the costs. Uh, for the procedures, for example, a, a bypass surgery in the U.S. that could cost over $100,000 could, could cost less than uh, $10,000 in Malaysia. And these, are, these include all the other uh, procedures as well, and people have taken advantage of this, providing packages for people who <clears throat> are interested in medical tourism. There are medical tourist destinations in, in very um, uh, exotic places that would include that would include sightseeing, shopping, and 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 spas. So these packages are <clears throat> are sold to individuals without the knowledge of whether the medical therapy that they're receiving is actually beneficial to them or not. So why is there so much hype of stem cells? If we look uh, at the popular media, including some of the well-reputable um, uh, magazines, including Time and Newsweek, we every once in a while we see even the coverage, the 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 cover of the magazine talking about the the potential of stem cells, and even we see that and hear that in our daily news. There are even books that are published on the miracle of, miracle of stem cell heart repair. However, if we look at the American stem cell uh, companies, it's an estimated $2 billion enterprise. However, if we look at the change in the market for the public stem cell companies from 2010 to 2011, almost all of them are in negative values, indicating that uh, the promises that are made by some of these companies and the, the extent of investment that we're putting into these companies, they're not paying back. So I'd like to go over a very brief history of stem cell biology and regenerative medicine to, to introduce the subject. Um, it, can be, it, it can go back as early as uh, 1938 when, a, um, when Hans Spemann actually published the result of his first nuclear transfer, which we now know as, as cloning. In 1970, uh, an embryologist uh, showed the existence of pluripotent stem cells after observing uh, teratoma formation in the, in the testes of, of mice. And it was in 1978 that the first baby as a result of in vitro fertilization was born. And since then, over 5 million births are aided by IVF uh, uh, worldwide. That is greater than 1% of all, all live births. <clears throat> it was in 1981 that Sir Martin Evans uh, derived pluripotent stem cells from mouse, embryo uh, mouse uh, uh, embryos. So this is the first embryonic stem cell line that was derived from mice that were used for uh, uh, generating different tissues. 
Whereas those were embryonic stem cells, in 1988, Irv Wiseman at Stanford uh, identified uh, hematopoietic stem cells that are considered adult stem cells as opposed to embryonic stem cells. Adult stem cells uh, exist in, in adult humans, whereas embryonic stem cells are <clears throat> what, what is present in the inner, inner cell mass of, uh, of developing embryos at the blastocyst, blastocyst stage. In 1995, human, uh, NIH Human Embryo Research Panel recommended uh, federal government funding research using both embryos left over from IVF and also on embryos created for experimentation. However, there was a, given the divided government, the Congress intervened and passed the Dickey Amendment banning stem cell research. And this has this Dickey Amendment has passed as a writer on all other on all legislations since 1997, prohibiting Health and Human Services and the National Institute of Funding for the creation of a human embryo for research purposes and a research in which a human embryo is destroyed, discarded, or knowingly subjected to risk of injury or death. So funding can be provided only for the leftover embryos from IVF uh, processes. So it made it illegal for government to fund, but not for private citizens to carry out the research. It was in 1997 that the first mammal, uh, Dolly, uh, was, was cloned. And 1998, as opposed to almost a, uh, 15 years earlier where mouse embryonic stem cells uh, were derived, uh, Jamie Thompson from University of Wisconsin isolated human embryonic stem cells from uh, leftover uh, embryos. With stem cells being in the, uh, in the spotlight, Clinton reconsidered his position, and uh, in 1999, um, the, the National Bioethics Advisory Committee recommended that human embryonic stem cells harvested from embryos discarded av uh, after IVF eligible for federal funding. However, the Dickey Amendment, again, uh, stood in the way. However, one of the most significant events that occurred during Clinton administration was the, the, the policy that was set by the chief counsel for the Department of Health and Human Services, where uh, she wrote a, a commentary that uh, further became part of the, the legislation that the government cannot fund any destruction of embryos, but can fund research once the stem cells are created, indicating that once the stem cells are out there from the leftover IVF embryos, they can, the, the government can fund that. However, the Bush administration, when uh, he came into uh, to, um, um, uh, when he took over, he put a hold on all NIH findings in January of 2001. And it took him seven months to issue his first decision regarding stem cells uh, in, a, in a TV speech. And similar to Clinton's decision, the NIH could fund research on stem cells after they were created. However, uh, he put uh, further restrictions. Uh, he stated that they can only be on already established stem cell lines where derivation uh, processes was initiated before uh, 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 August of 2001 and must have been derived from embryos created for reproductive purposes and no uh, longer needed and informed consent have been obtained. And the informed consent, uh, the consent that had to be obtained was very, very significant because if the consent was, in, was obtained to use the embryonic stem cells for derivation, for example, of pancreatic cell lines, that cell line could not be used for derivation of any other cells. And this, was, this proved to be extremely important and it was seen as a compromise by much of the media but heavily criticized by the scientific community. We initially thought that there were 77 lines available from the leftover embryos uh, by IVF. However, it turned out to be only 21 available, and most of them are contaminated and others had genetic mutations. So this put a lot of money and power in the hands of those that owned these lines because they were able to distribute them to, to the scientific community. However, during the Bush uh, era, the state spoke out. In 2004, California passed Proposition 71 that authorized the state to spend $3 billion on embryonic stem cell research, making it larger uh, funder than the federal government itself. California Institute of Regenerative Medicine was born in 2004 and still going on funding research on human embryonic stem cells. Similar efforts were seen in other states. In 2005, 70% in a poll, 70% of Americans favored loosening the Bush administration, and that included greater than 50% of the conservatives. 
<coughs> uh, President Bush used his first ever veto in July of 2006 to veto a bill that would have increased federal funding for embryonic stem cell. And it's very interesting to note that uh, George Bush vetoed only 12 bills in his two terms, as opposed to 44 for his father in, his own, in only one term. And of those 12 bills, only seven did not become law, and three of those seven bills were for increased stem cell uh, funding. This indicates the importance of, of stem cell in his, uh, in his administration. However, the scientists continued, and in 2007, uh, Shane Yamanaka and Jamie Thompson, uh, Jamie Thompson actually uh, found a way to reprogram somatic cells into a state that's similar to uh, pluripotent stem cells, and they, kept, they called it induced pluripotent stem cells. <clears throat> and then uh, Obama campaigned promising to increase federal funding for stem cell research, and in his first 100 days, Obama reversed the Bush administration, but also extended the Dickey, Dickey Amendment, thus returning the policy to that of the Clinton era. In the years between Clinton and Obama, many other stem cells were created by private industry, a total of a greater than 75, However, in 2011, two adult stem cell researchers actually sued the federal government for, um, uh, for funding stem cell research, indicating that the money that was being given to stem cell research was being taken away from uh, adult stem cell research. And the government issued a preliminary um, injunction on the funding of uh, human embryonic stem cells. However, it went to a, the, the court in Washington, D.C., and the appeal was granted an administrative uh, stay of uh, this injunction, thus returning to the federal funding of the initial Obama policy. However, this whole concept of using human embryonic stem cells for regenerative purposes continued, and advanced cell technology won FDA approval to, tell, to test stem cell therapy for degenerative eye disease. UCLA is part of this clinical trial, the first use of human embryonic stem cells for regeneration of the uh, pigmented uh, retinal cells. And in 2012, Deepak Servastava, who actually gave a ground rounds here uh, not too long ago, reported the in vivo reprogramming of fibroblasts into cardiomyocytes, indicating a way of bypassing human embryonic stem cells and using uh, somatic cells for cardiac regeneration. And it was uh, approximately two to three years ago that Yamanaka, who um, w played an instrumental role for uh, generating iPSCs or induced pluripotent stem cells along with Gordon, won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for the groundbreaking um, stem cell research. So why so much hype and interest in, in stem cells. The story that has, above all others, captured the imagination of those involved in regenerative medicine and regener regeneration research is the Greek myth of Prometheus. I can say that countless lectures and articles about regenerative medicine begin with a um, reference to this myth. Um, when hearing this tale, we cannot help but wonder if the ancient Greeks actually uh, had witnessed the amazing capacity of the liver to restore its, uh, itself. The myth goes that when Prometheus transgressed the laws of ancient gods and stole fire for humankind to teach them civilization and arts, his punishment was typically, typically brutal. The gods had the great titan chained to the side of Mount Caucasus, where a vulture preyed daily on his liver, which was renewed as quickly as it was devoured. <clears throat> if we think about the regenerative potential in different organs, and we look at different organisms, <clears throat> uh, lower organisms, including zebrafish and amphibians, have a very, very potent uh, ability to regenerate, regenerate organs. If, you <clears throat> if one cuts the limb of, a, of an amphibian, uh, we can actually observe its regeneration in, in uh, real time. And also in zebrafish, uh, <clears throat> resection of part of the heart, even in adult zebrafish, <clears throat> within less than a month uh, results in regeneration of the entire heart without any fibrosis. And it was reported recently, well, about three years ago, that in neonatal mice, in mammalian hearts, in neonatal period between day one and day seven, a resection of the apical part of the heart results in complete regeneration without any scar formation. However, as we know in humans, the loss of cardiomyocytes causes fibrotic scar formation, furthermore remodeling and uh, uh, heart uh, uh, resulting in heart failure. 
So the, 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 the old dogma was the heart was a terminally differentiated organ. However, in 2001, um, a, the pathologist uh, reported that uh, the border zone of uh, the, the area of an infarct uh, from autopsy of patients dying 4 to 12 days after MI, they showed evidence of low uh, myocyte proliferations, particularly in the area of uh, injury. And in 2002, uh, <clears throat> Uh, a group in New York examined heart cardiac tissue from males receiving female donors, and they showed evidence of recipient-derived cardiomyocytes and endothelial cells in, in, in the heart, indicating if, if there is a possibility of regenerating the, donor, the, the cardiomyocytes from the recipient in the donor hearts. And then uh, it was in 2002 that there was a report indicating that bone marrow cells could regenerate the infarcted myocardium. However, this became extremely uh, uh, controversial, and it was, um, uh, it was proven not to be entirely true by a number of groups, including one group from uh, one of our groups at, uh, at Stanford, showing that the hematopoietic stem cells do not dif transdifferentiate into cardiomyocytes and an editorial in, um, in nature uh, stated that the potential use of stem cells as agents of repair in human disease makes them the subject of high profile studies, but we should be wary of prematurely pushing laboratory research into clinical practice, as was uh, stated by the initial uh, 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 example that I gave you. So this assumed plasticity of adult stem cells, bone marrow cells turned into cardiomyocytes, led to a rush of clinical application of several types uh, of cells for stem cell therapy to re restore cardiac function, including bone marrow cells, skeletal myoblasts, mesenchymal cells, circulating progenitor cells, and with the route of delivery into a coronary, epicardial, endocardial for acute MI, chronic heart failure, and chronic ischemic heart disease. And the assessments were for endpoints of safety, feasibility, and cardiac function, including several, thousands, several thousand people. However, no evidence of robust repopulation of the damaged myocardium. <clears throat> the whole concept of the heart wither has the ability to regenerate itself has not been very well established. However, uh, about five years ago, a very a uh, nice paper in Science showed that looking at the carbon dating in, in the cardiomyocytes that showed that very, very, there is very, very slow regenerative potential of the cardiomyocytes. Based on those studies, we developed a mouse model in our laboratory where we took uh, two fluorescent proteins, uh, one coding for a red protein, so you can, under microscope, you can see red, and one for green protein, GFP, and we cut it in half. We put half of the GFP on one chromosome, the other half on the other chromosome, and the same thing with the RFP. We, uh, it's called mosaic analysis of double markers, madam, and when there is recombination, the fluorescent proteins line up, so based on division, we get a cell that, the parental cell that has no fluorescent uh, capability, generating two daughter cells, one red and one, uh, uh, one green, as you can see here. And this is a beautiful system that you can clonally analyze whether cardiomyocytes undergo division. Because if you do see evidence of red and um, uh, green cells, that indicates that these cardiomyocytes have undergone division. And our studies uh, agreed with the previous finding from the carbon-14 uh, dating, showing that the, the rate of cardiomyocyte division is extremely low. We see more cardiomyocyte division during early uh, development. However, in immature cardiomyocytes, we don't see very um, uh, robust proliferation. To further address that question, we developed another mouse model, because mouse model is very uh, um, it's easier to, to genetically modify, and we call the mouse model rainbow. We took four different uh, fluorescent proteins, a green, blue, orange, and red, and we put them into a ROSA26 locus, which is uh, uh, constitutively expressed. We put flux protein uh, between them so that a Cree administration would actually cause uh, excision of these flux proteins so that a single um, uh, fluorescent protein is expressed. And they would, this would indicate that if we label a single cell and follow it 
uh, prospectively, we can, if we see a cluster of cells of the same color, we can 100% be sure that it's coming from the same uh, progenitor. So this is a uh, this is probably the first method that can be used to do clonal analysis. So in a population of cells, if we see the presence of six or seven, seven, uh, for example, blue cells in cluster, the chances of this being random recombination to blue color would be less than 0.005%. So we're very confident that this is a clonal analysis to identify a single cell that has, uh, that has, um, has the ability to proliferate. When we generated these mice and we crossed them with uh, cardiac specific markers, for example, MESP1, which is one of the transcription factors in early cardiac development, NKX2.5, which is one of the cardiovascular progenitor markers, and alpha MHC, which is one of the mature cardiomyocytes, we do see a, um, a, a representation of mosaic presentation of these hearts. These are um, uh, hearts that were looked uh, that were sacked and looked at at E14 and half. E14 and half means that 14 and half days since uh, conception, and it's uh, usually about a 21 day uh, pregnancy. So P1 is day one of uh, birth after birth, and P21 is 21 days after birth. And here we can see. Um, <clears throat> When we use the cardiovascular progenitors, MESP1 and NKX2.5, we do see areas of clones indicating, for example, on the, uh, here in the right upper corner, a cluster of green, uh, yellow cells, and here we see a cluster of uh, red cells. This suggests that perhaps during early development, we have assigned a red color to a single cell, and this has proliferated in uh, uh, resulting in a cluster of cells. However, when we look at the alpha MHC, which is a marker for mature cardiomyocytes, we see a mosaic presentation indicating that these cells perhaps don't have the ability to undergo division. And this is a very important concept because we're trying to de determine whether it's the cardiomyocytes that undergo division or the cardiovascular progenitors. And this is a representation of a rainbow heart that we can actually Every dot is a single cardiomyocyte that we have been following throughout development, indicating that perhaps the clusters of blue or the clusters of uh, red or green, for example here, the <coughs> blue and the, the yellow are, are a clonal expansion of a single cell during development. So we went ahead and performed these clonal analysis, analysis using a Cree system that we can actually control. And this is a mutated Cree uh, system. Uh, we call it uh, inducible Cree, where uh, tamoxifen can bind to the Cree protein. The Cree is mutated so that it cannot enter the nucleus. Once tamoxifen binds to it, it renders it so that it can enter the nucleus and cause the excision of the, flo uh, of the flux P sites. Now here we used a um, beta actin. Beta actin is expressed in all cells. We used an NKX 2.5, which is expressed only in cardiovascular progenitors and alpha MHC. When we gave tamoxifen at E12 and half, and we uh, looked at it at P30, 30 days after birth, we wanted to see if we label a single cell. What happens after? Uh, this would be after 40 days, after 40 days of labeling, what happens to that cell? When we use beta actin, we can label any cell. So the chances of labeling a progenitor during development is high. And just as we expected, we see a cluster of cells here. Uh, here, these uh, yellow cells indicate that at E12 and half, we were able to label a single cardiac progenitor. The same thing can be seen with NKX 2.5, the cluster of blue cells originate from a single cell that expressed NKX 2.5. However, when we use alpha MHC, which is a marker for mature cardiomyocytes, so if we mark a mature cardiomyocyte at E12 and half, we did not see much proliferation. We saw perhaps one or two single cells here and there. At, at most, we would see a couple of cells, indicating that we, it gave us, the, gave us the hypothesis that perhaps cardiovascular progenitor and stem cells contribute to heart development. Once cardiomyocytes are formed based on the expression of alpha MHC, they lose their proliferative capacity. 
Um, this is very important because previously it was thought that cardiomyocytes have the ability, may have the ability to, um, to proliferate. And this was our hypothesis. And using the clonal analysis approach, we were able to actually prove that our hypothesis was incorrect. Here we used uh, beta-actin and we, we induced recombination, meaning we labeled single cells at E9 and half, and we followed them at P2, P7, P15, and P30. And as we expected, we saw clusters of cells, indicating that these cells have the ability to, to proliferate. The same thing was observed with NKX 2.5. And very interestingly, when we used alpha MHC earlier in life at E9 and half, we were able to see small clusters, indicating that this whole concept of stem cells and at one point turning into mature cardiomyocyte perhaps is not entirely correct. It's more of a spectrum of, of transition that stem cells start expressing cardiac specific markers and they lose their capacity to proliferate as they mature. Very interestingly, when we used, when we marked cells even earlier during cardiac development, for example, here we're seeing a cluster of cells, we saw that uh, these clusters include, included cardiomyocytes, endothelial cells, and vascular smooth muscle cells, indicating that we have identified a multipotent progenitor during cardiac development that can give rise to not only cardiomyocytes, the muscle of the heart, but also the supporting vasculature and the fibroblast. So the question comes whether these cells have the ability to undergo division after injury. So what we did, we used, we ligated the, uh, the, the, um, the left anterior descending artery on a P1, a newborn mouse. We ligated the anterior, uh, uh, left anterior descending artery to cause an MI. And we showed that it regenerates. And we showed that there are cl clusters of cardiomyocytes um, that contribute to the regeneration. Therefore, during the early phases of development, you can cause injury to the heart and the heart is capable of regenerating itself. When we did the same thing to an adult mouse using the rainbow mouse model, we unfortunately, we saw only single cells indicating that we labeled single cells and they remained single. So they, 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 they had lost their ability to, to proliferate. These results all together indicate that uh, the cardiomyocytes have very, they do have uh, proliferative capacity, but it's very, very limited. So if you consider cell therapy for cardiac regeneration, and we have a lot of options, but there are many more potential barriers. Bone marrow cells, we have convincingly shown that uh, there is lack of uh, uh, differentiation to cardiomyocytes. People have used skeletal myoblasts, but there is long-term engraftment pro problems uh, causing uh, arrhythmias. People talk about resident cardiac stem cells, but this is inconclusive and they're in insufficient numbers, even if they do exist. And endogenous cardiomyocyte proliferation, these are terminally differentiated and they have very, as we have shown with our rainbow mouse model, they have very low proliferative capacity. The question comes whether human embryonic stem cells, we know that they turn into cardiomyocytes. We know that a blastocyst as develops, as it develops, forms an, an entire uh, heart organ. And if we take the inner cell mass from a blastocyst stage and we culture them, under right conditions, we can actually uh, form cardiomyocytes. So the question is whether these cells would, would uh, contribute to cardiac regeneration. So human embryonic stem cells, as I uh, indicated earlier, um, uh, are derived from the inner cell mass and they can be cultured uh, under right conditions to generate different tissues. Uh, if, if, con if cultured under appropriate uh, conditions, they can make liver cells, pancreatic cells, bone cells, uh, um, heart cells, and, and neurons. So our approach has been to use human embryonic stem cells and use markers. We use uh, fluorescent markers to, to label specific populations of cells because the differentiation of these cells yield, uh, it yields different types of cells. So our goal is to purify a pure population of cardiac cells. And in order to do that, we have used genetic engineering techniques by incorporating a fluorescent protein into the human embryonic stem cells, uh, different colors. So when we differentiate them, when the color comes on, we know that these are the cardiac, uh, cardiac cells. And we can use cell sorter 
to isolate these cells, a pure population of cardiomyocytes, and then we do analysis and uh, we do in vivo and in vitro characterization and their developmental potential. So we used one of these reporter lines. When I say reporter line, it's a, a human embryonic stem cell that has a fluorescent protein that can be used to isolate a pure population of cardiac cells. We used a mixel. Mixel is one of the markers for mesoderm that gives rise to cardiac cells. And using these, uh, these lines, we identified two surface markers, CD13 and ROR2, that were used to, uh, to highly enrich for cardiac cells. The reason for using uh, surface markers was that we do not want to use genetically modified markers, uh, cell lines, because of uh, potential hazard in case this goes on to human clinical trials. When we perform these experiments using CD13 and ROR2 on uh, native cell lines that are not genetically engineered, we were able to show that these cells actually enrich for uh, cardiac specific cells. And we actually showed that they upregulate CD56 and downregulate CD326, which is an indicative of these cells undergoing EMT or epithelial to mesenchymal transition uh, on their way to become uh, cardiac cells. We performed extensive gene, and, uh, gene, uh, gene expression analysis, and we identified that cells uh, differentiating, differentiating human embryonic stem cells, if we use CD13 and ROR2 and isolate cells that express these two markers, are actually enriched for cardiac specific cells, as indicated by, by this slide. So we use these two markers and uh, we use these two markers on a on a multi-reporter line where NKX 2.5 is green and alpha MHC is red. Again, NKX 2.5 is a marker for cardiac progenitors and alpha MHC is a marker for mature cardiomyocytes. And we showed that the cells that express NKX 2.5 can go on and become endothelial cells and vascular smooth muscle cells, whereas cells that are um, alpha MHC, they can go on and become cardiomyocytes. And when we culture these, they start uh, simultaneously contracting. And we've done very extensive um, uh, characterization of these cells to show that they uh, actually are, they, they resemble mature cardiomyocytes. So we went ahead and did what most people do with these types of experiments. We took a skid mouse, a, an immunocompromised mouse, and we ligated the left anterior descending artery, and we transplanted these cells to see they actually regenerate the infarcted area. And as you can see here, the green area is the area where we transplanted cells. We just um, labeled them with GFP so we can see them. And the circular area here, you can actually see the knot here, is the area where the LAD was ligated. And we looked at these hearts about eight weeks later, and we showed that uh, they turned into cardiomyocytes, as you can see. However, they were all uh, isolated in areas. They were never, we never saw any evidence of integration of these cells into the host myocardium. We also saw evidence of uh, endothelial cell formation. Very interestingly, if we sorted for the negative populations, that CD13 ROR2 negative population, we, one of the seven mice that were transplanted with these cells formed uh, a teratoma, indicating that there were still residual pluripotent stem cells in the negative population, highlighting the need for use of surface markers or markers, biomarkers, to purify for cardiovascular progenitors. So as I showed you, these, um, we showed that the cardiovascular progenitors engraft and mature to cardiomyocytes, but we showed absolutely no evidence of integration of the donor cells into the host uh, tissue. So we needed a better model, a better in vivo model to evaluate the fate of human embryonic stem cell uh, progenitors. The best model would be to put it in, in a live human, but this is not the time for doing any of these experiments. It's, it's, it's uh, premature. So what we did next was probably the next best thing by taking human fetal heart and isolating the left ventricle and transplanting it into the ear of a skid mouse, an immunocompromised mouse. And as you can see, it's highly vascularized. And about one week, less than a week later, the human fetal heart in the mouse starts beating. And this is the EKG of the human fetal heart going at about 60 beats per minute, whereas the, human, the mouse heart goes at about um, 
uh, 600 beats per minute. As you can see, it's very vascularized and it engrafts very well, so this would provide the left ventricle of a human fetal heart where we can transplant our cells and see if they integrate or not. However, if you think about it, this is, this is only a left ventricle. It's a tissue. It's not a, an entire organ. What we need is a, a, an entire functioning organ where we can do these experiments. So the next set of experiments that we did was we actually took a human fetal heart, the entire organ, and we transplanted it heterotopically into the abdomen of a, of a nude rat, an immunocompromised rat. So the rat has its own heart, and it also has a human fetal heart uh, that continues to beat. And as you can see, uh, we close the abdomen, and you can actually put your hand on the abdomen of a rat, and you can actually feel the human fetal heart beating in the, in the abdomen of, of the rat. So this heterotopic heart transplantation in the abdomen provides a very uh, appropriate model to test our <clears throat> transplantation studies. So we can actually take our human embryonic stem cells and transplant it into the human fetal heart that has been transplanted into the new rat. And very interestingly, when we did these experiments using fluorescent labeled human embryonic stem cells, we, sh we showed that uh, the transplanted cells actually engraft and integrate and they migrate. So we injected it into a couple of uh, several sites. However, we saw the migration of these cells eight weeks later into the entire uh, region of the left ventricle. Very interestingly, we showed here that there is presence of connexin 43. Connexin 43 is one of the gap junctions that's present uh, between cardiomyocytes. And very interestingly, we showed that there, there are um, gap junctions formed between the transplanted cells and the host myocardium. And we showed not only it was structurally integrated, how uh, it was also functionally integrated by, by doing uh, transient calcium experiments showing that electrical uh, propagation goes from the host myocardium into the transplanted cells and back into the host myocardium. Now, these experiments are all fine, however, there are ethical issues concerned with the use of human fetal heart, as well as they're very, very difficult experiments. Probably one out of every eight or nine experiment actually works. We wanted to do it in a more um, uh, reproducible and uh, something that other uh, uh, centers can use as well. So uh, over the past year here at UCLA, we have developed a large animal facility where we can transplant these cells into the uh, pig my, uh, myocardium. We have developed a, an iron labeling uh, technique where we actually label the human embryonic stem cells with iron. Uh, it does not affect their viability or their differentiation potential. We isolate the cardiac specific cells. We transplant it into the uh, pig myocardium and we do the MRI. The reason for iron labeling is so that we can actually monitor these cells after uh, at, the, at the MRI. And then we do histologic analysis of these hearts. Very interestingly, we showed that iron labeling can actually uh, enable us to follow the presence of the cells even up to 40, uh, 40 days. So we can actually track the, the, the exact location uh, of the transplanted cells for up to 40 days. And then when we sacked these, uh, these pigs and we looked at their, um, their hearts, uh, we were very surprised, pleasantly surprised to see that the cardiomyocyte, the cells that we transplanted differentiated into cardiomyocytes and they engrafted into, into the host myocardium. And as you can see here, you can see very nice striation of structural proteins in cardiomyocytes. And these are GFP cells um, uh, this is staining for troponin, indicating that these are uh, cardiomyocytes. And we also did human mitochondrial staining, showing, differentiating the human cells from the pig cells. Uh, we wanted to make sure that what we're looking at is actually the cells that we transplanted rather than <clears throat> the porcine um, cardiomyocytes. Very interestingly, we, show, we, saw, we observed that, that there are endothelial cells derived from the transplanted cells, as well as uh, smooth muscle cells, indicating that these are probably multipotent progenitors that we're transplanting into the heart, and they have the ability to differentiate into other organs. So 
the next question would be whether these cells actually integrated into the host myocardium. And we, we looked very, very hard. Unfortunately, we were unable to show the presence of gap junctions between the transplanted cells and the host myocardium. We showed presence of connexin 43 between the transplanted cells, but not between the transplanted cells and the host myocardium. Whether this is a problem with interspecies differences or this needs to be further uh, repeated we need to repeat these uh, animals just to make sure whether what we're observing right now is correct or not. But currently, we believe that perhaps because of interspecies differences, the lack of functional integration of these cells into the myocardium could be a potential danger because they may actually be a source for um, uh, arrhythmias. So I've talked about uh, ROR2 and CD13, these two markers, and I, I haven't told you what ROR2 is. So ROR uh, is a receptor tyrosine kinase-like kinase orphan receptor, and I had no idea what it was before we did the uh, gene expression analysis. Once we found out what ROR2 was, I went back to literature to look at it. It's a Wnt receptor that's involved in developmental processes, including cell migration and polarity. And very interestingly, ROR2 mutation <clears throat> results in uh, Robinow syndrome, which is which results in a form of uh, short-limb dwarfism, and very interestingly, almost all these patients also have uh, cardiac uh, defects, and the cardiac defects arises from both myocardi myocardial defects as as well as <coughs> vascular and valvular uh, defects. So. Finding this out was very interesting to me to see whether ROR2 actually plays a role in cardiac development. So going back into literature, uh, people were studying ROR2 for something completely different, but I found a, a publication that looked at ROR2 expression in the heart, and at E13 and half, they were showing that the, the heart actually expresses ROR2. So these people went ahead for other purposes, developed a transgenic mouse to uh, knock out ROR2, and they showed that the majority, almost all of these mice, they they die within the first four to six hours after birth, uh, and it was thought to be to underdevelopment of the lungs. And when they looked at the heart, they showed that the majority of, of, of these mice actually had myocardial defect. So the question uh, is whether ROR2 was expressed in human cardiac um, development as well. And we looked at uh, human fetal hearts from first and second trimester, and we showed that, uh, very interestingly, there are pockets of uh, cells that express ROR2 that also co-express NKX2.5, which is one of the markers for uh, uh, cardiovascular cells. So overall, what we have shown, what I've tried to show here today um, is the challenges that we're um, facing with stem cell therapy. I think before it goes into any kind of clinical trial, we we need to do a lot more. We need to build scientific community. We need to identify and isolate pure populations without any contamination. We need details in vitro and in vivo uh, models. We need good animal models to study their arrhythmogenic potential and in their integration. And um, we need to find out what's the best and optimal routes of uh, delivery of these cells. So uh, at the end of the talk, I, I want to I want to tell you, I, I do this kind of research. I do believe that stem cell therapy hope is real, but has been overshadowed by a lot of hype. Um, we're nowhere close to thinking that stem cell can be applied to the heart uh, now with our current knowledge. We need to do a lot more um, investigation in this field. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, this has become a very... Um, a exciting and, and sexy field, and people are overexcited about this and they want to, um, to take it prematurely to, um, to clinical trials. So I want to close by um, telling you the story that three umpires were asked how they call balls and strikes. The first one said, I call the way I see them, and this person acknowledges perception and reality are blurred. The second umpire said, I call them the way they are, and this person confuses perception with reality. And the third one says, they ain't nothing till I call them. And this defines reality. And unfortunately, this has been the way in, in a lot of uh, stem cell therapy in, in, in the cardiovascular field. And I hope in the near future, um, we'll be able to, uh, to take this into clinical trial after good science. I want to thank my, my lab and also the, the source of funding for, uh, for this research. And I thank you for your attention.